more push back in session. Who's going to be next? Detective David Kotzman, Your Honor. I mean, he may be listed as William Kotzman on the. That was sent to you. I have that for you if you need to see it again. That was sent about a week or two beforehand after our free trial. And we communicated that if we did let out of your original packet, just respect copies. Is he out there? A separate um, later admission to um, to Mr. Hopkins, so that may be why it's not in his file folder. We're going to ask the court if you could make a physical copy for him at this time. How many pages? Uh, uh, it's about 10, 12, mostly shadows. What's it already in Joshua Hills? Mostly shadows. Um, he he was along in the investigation with Detective Hill. Out there? Oh, okay. Wait. Wait. He needs to see the jinx first. Okay. That's fine. All right. Please be seated. All right, please. Detective William David Kotzman. Introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and spell your last name for the court reporter. Sure. My name is William Kotzman, K A U T Z M A N. Where are you presently employed? Presently employed with the Metro National Police Department. What is your current rank? Rank? Uh, I'm a sergeant with the police department. How long have you been with the Metro Police Department? I've been with the police department for about 12 years. I've been a sergeant for about five years. What particular assignments have you held within the police department? Uh, I've held the, the role of a patrol officer. Um, I was also a, a case-carrying detective for a while. Um, after I got promoted to the rank of sergeant, I was a patrol supervisor. Um, and uh, I also served in the role of a, of a detective sergeant, which is basically a supervisor of an investigative unit. Where did you primarily do your detective work? In Madison Precinct. And uh, the types of cases that you would handle as a precinct detective, would those include homicides? Yes, ma'am. And prior to um, the homicide investigation of Johanna Ortega, had you investigated several homicides? Yes, ma'am. Were you in the company of a, another detective um, assigned to your supervision? Yes, I was. It was Detective Josh Hill. And is he here in the courtroom today, counsel yes, table? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. How did you and Detective Hill end up arriving at the crime scene, uh, lot C2? Uh, we were asked um, through our chain of command by our lieutenant to respond to that address. Uh, we, we weren't part of the initial response, but we were asked to come in um, and assist with that investigation initially. Can you explain um, a little bit about... Um, the difference between a Madison precinct detective and a youth services detective? Sure. Um, the detectives assigned to the precincts investigate a wide variety of crimes. They range all the way from uh, minor crimes like thefts and shopliftings all the way up uh, to homicides. Um, we investigate all manners of aggravated assaults, um, which include like shootings and stabbings. So just a, a wide variety of, of both personal and property crimes. Uh, the Youth Services Division uh, investigates um, crimes primarily where the, the victims are children. Um, 
that includes child abuse cases and things of that nature. Uh, they also investigate the uh, deaths of some small children uh, that are under the age of 13. And would it be accurate to say that while youth service detectives can investigate um, homicides of children, a vast amount of their experience is in, say, shaken baby or child abuse or that type of um, homicide investigation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, their their primary, I guess, expertise is in is in the child abuse, uh, and, and our primary expertise is in, um, I guess, you would say, homicides that are not child abuse. And did this case kind of land smack in the middle of those two? types of case assignments between the Madison Precinct detectives and the youth services detectives? Yes, ma'am, it did. Uh, initially, um, uh, according to our, what we usually do, is a death of a, of a child under 13 is investigated by youth services. There were indications at the crime scene um, that um, this case needed to be investigated by someone with, with experience in homicide investigations that were other than child abuse related. And is that where you and Detective Hill um, ended up becoming involved? Yes, ma'am, it is. When you first responded to the scene um, at Lot C2, do you know what time it was? It was about 20.08, 8.08 p.m. 8.08 p.m. So other officers and detectives were already on the scene when you arrived? Yes, ma'am. When you were called out there, were you called out as the lead detective? We initially responded just to assist the, the other units that were already there, including youth services. Uh, that's what we thought we were responding, uh, just in, in the, uh, to assist them. As soon as we got there, uh, we, we were told that we would be taking over the investigation as the lead unit. And was that decision made by um, persons higher up in the command of the police department? Yes, ma'am, it was. Uh, once that decision was made, um, who became the lead detective in this particular case? A detective Josh Hill. And um, given your experience, did you, how would you describe your involvement or assistance with Detective Hill? Sure. Um, I, I investigated dozens of homicides uh, previous to this and hundreds of other uh, cases involving violence. Um, so I signed Detective Josh Hill as the lead detective. And um, due to the nature of this case, I was going to take a, a very hands-on role with it, um, just because it's such a such a sensitive case. Um, so um, I basically decided. Usually, we have two detectives that work very close together on a big case like this. So I decided to take the role of, of the second the second detective. Uh, so yeah. even though you were a supervisor um, in some respects, you decided to step in and basically become partners with Detective Hill. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when the two of you arrived at the scene, well, let me back up for a moment. What shift did you normally work at this time? We normally worked uh, from 3 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. So do you know approximately what time it was that you woke up to go to work that day, August 10th? Uh, or what time you would have kind of begun your day normally? I mean, our, our shift would have started at 3. Uh, I probably... I don't, I don't remember that day. I, I, my normal habit at the time was to wake up between 8 and 9, but I don't know. And when you responded, um, what was the first thing that you and Detective Hill did? Uh, well, the first thing we did was get briefed by patrol officers on, on what they had. Uh, we could see that they had already established a crime scene, put up the crime scene tape. Um, uh, there was a number of... Um, other units, like I said, there were there were people from youth services and I think uh, sex crimes and um, a variety of, of command staff were there. Um, so we consulted with our lieutenant, um, and uh, then we got briefed by patrol officers on on what they had found when they arrived. Now, by the time that you had arrived, had. Um, anyone taken any, um, gotten any preliminary information from the mother of, um, of Joanna about um, the approximate time of their last communication? Yes, yes. And um, initially, 
what was the time frame you believe that you were um, looking at and investigating? Uh, for the first few days, we thought we were looking at the time frame of 17.30 or 5.30 p.m. from that day uh, when Juana had sent her mother a text. And um, after actual forensic interview, uh, forensic um, evidence was developed from the electronic devices, were you able to determine a more was a more accurate time determined? Yes, ma'am. And what was that? Uh, we determined that that text was sent closer to 1615 or 415 p.m. that afternoon. So when the initial canvassing and, and asking different um, people nearby, were you focusing around that time frame of 530 as opposed to 415? Initially, yes. Did you have an opportunity on August the 10th, and I'm not going to ask you anything about what was said, but did you have an opportunity to meet Johanna's father, Marlon Ortega? Yes, I did. And were you able to um, speak with him? I did. How would you describe um, his demeanor or attitude towards you? He was very cooperative, but obviously heartbroken. And did you have an opportunity to also uh, meet certain friends um, and church associates of the Ortega family as well. Yes, ma'am. And specifically on that date, um, did you have any requests that were made uh, that was made concerning the footwear of the friends and family that were, were there? Yes, ma'am, I did. Would you describe that for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Sure. Um, the uh, some close friends and family members uh, of the Ortega family went to Madison Precinct, uh, where our office was, to, um, to be interviewed. I requested uh, one of my detectives to photograph uh, each one of them uh, at the station with the footwear that they had on so that we can see the, the tread pattern and, and what, their, what their shoes look like. And why did you do that? There was some pattern bruising um, on Joanna's face when she was found. Um, it seemed very likely that it could have come from a shoe tread, uh, so we wanted to check um, all those people's shoes to make sure that it, the tread wasn't similar to what was on Joanna's face. And throughout the course of your investigation, were there um, was this hunt for a shoe or collections of shoes um, a long-going theme throughout your investigation? Yes, yes. And were you ever able to, um, with certainty and scientific clarity, identify one shoe to um, the pattern on Johanna's face? No, ma'am, we weren't. But were attempts made? Yes. Now, going back to when you initially arrived on the scene, you told us about how the crime scene was secured. Mm -hmm. um, did this include um, secured from police officers traipsing in and out of the scene. Yes, we knew this was going to be a, a, a very important scene to keep um, from contaminating with, with extra people going through or going in. Um, so we had a discussion with our CSI personnel and decided that only uh, a very select few people would be allowed into the trailer. And was that um, CSI personnel, um, Lynette Mace? Yes, ma'am. And um, at the time that you went in and made your observations. Could you describe the circumstances of who went in and under what conditions? Uh, I did an initial walkthrough, uh, which is, this is kind of a standard procedure when we arrive to a scene, is we'll do an initial walkthrough, usually with our CSI personnel. Um, also with me were Detective Hill and Lieutenant McCall. Um, and basically we just take a look at the crime scene um, so that we can get an idea of um, what the next priorities and, and how we're going to proceed from there. Now, the jury has had the opportunity to look at various photographs, and I'm not going to pull those back out. But um, as part of your observation, did you go into the room that was shared by Johanna and Jocelyn? Yes, I did. How would you describe the floor <coughs> surface in that room? It, it was incredibly messy. And. Um, did you in any way alter or, or touch anything about Johanna's body at that time? No. Okay. <coughs> How
how did you, how were you able to actually get close enough to view the pattern injuries of Johanna's face? Um, because of the concerns with contamination, I didn't want to get too close at all. Um, so um, once CSI, Lynn Mace, took a photograph of that bruising, she showed me a picture um, on the back of her digital camera on the screen. So rather than you go up and bend over and become close to the body, you stayed and viewed that injury on the film? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Now, could you describe the clothing and um, the positioning of the clothing on Johanna when you were in the room? Sure. Um, the most, I guess the most noticeable thing um, was that she was found kind of like she'd been dressed for, almost like she'd been dressed for bed. She was wearing pajama pants. Um, except her pajama pants and her underwear were both pulled down um, to her thighs, almost to her knees. Did they, were they pulled down in different layers of length of exposure, or did they, were they consistent with being pulled down together? No, they, they had been pulled down together. Inside the panties of... Johanna was a used menstrual pad found and located. Yes, ma'am, it was. And was that, in fact, collected as part of the evidence in this case? Yes, ma'am. Did you um, take steps to investigate um, even the trash cans for evidence? Yes, ma'am, I did. Could you explain that for the jury? Sure. Um, we checked the trash cans. Um, for evidence to see if uh, there might be any anything in there that would be of, of use. Uh, even there, there was a bathroom adjoining Joanna's bedroom uh, with a trash can full of used menstrual pads, and I, I went through that entire trash can uh, by hand just to see if there was anything of, that we could use in there. When you were in the living, living room, um, were you able to observe anything that was consistent with something someone might use with a foot or ankle injury? Yes, ma'am. There was like a walking style orthopedic boot. And do you remember approximately where that was? I believe it was close to the couch. Did you have an occasion to um, view the bathroom on the opposite end of the trailer referred to as the master bathroom. Yes, ma'am, I did. Would you describe what, if anything, was unusual about that bathroom? Uh, sure, yeah. It was, um, most of you, well, when we first got there, the door to that bathroom was closed. Um, once it had been opened, um, we could see that the uh, glass from that bathroom window had been taken out of the frame and set in the adjoining sink. Uh, there was a few things scattered around on the on the vanity. Uh, there was also a shelf uh, that had been knocked down off the wall and was sitting on top of the. It was partially sitting on top of the toilet seat, so it was, it was laying on the floor and leaning up on the toilet seat. Um, there was also a curtain from the bathroom uh, that hung over that same window that was caught in the window uh, and had been partially torn. Now, Detective, did, did you view some photographs earlier today? Yes, ma'am. And do you know what, where those photographs ended up that you were viewing? Uh, I think I've got them in my briefcase over there. Okay. Would this be your... Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Jumping ahead just a moment, um, how long did, uh, how long was this scene um, held? We held the scene for a week. Uh, this happened on August the 10th, and we held it until August the 17th. What was the purpose of holding the scene for this period of time? Um, we just wanted to make sure that we did as thorough a job as possible, um, especially with the nature of this case. It's not our, usually we process the scene once and then release it back to whoever's property it is, but uh, this case in particular, we wanted to have every opportunity to uh, come, back, come back, and if we got more information that would give us more ideas of what we were looking for, um, we could 
then come back and collect more evidence. Is that standard to hold a scene for that length of period? No, ma'am. That's, that's the first time I've ever done that in any of my investigations. And when you talk about holding that scene, does that mean that you are actually um, just putting tape around it and leaving, or is there an additional step? No, it's it's secured the, the, the same way it is um, with the crime scene tape around the around it. But then we also station a uniformed officer um, at that location. That uniformed officer is there to keep anyone from going in or out, uh, and also to make a um, you know they keep observations for us in the neighborhood, that kind of thing. Did um, you return to that? Um crime scene on more than one occasion throughout that period of time it was held? Yes, ma'am. Did you, in fact, respond on numerous occasions? Yes, ma'am. And would you periodically spot different items that you requested to be collected? Yes, ma'am, I did. And did you yourself actually even take some selected photographs of different things at different times? Yes, ma'am. Handing you six photographs, and um, if you could just look at them briefly without describing them and let me know if those are the photographs you reviewed this morning and if they fairly and accurately depict certain places and items within the home as you saw them. Yes, ma'am. Um, do those include some photographs that were taken um, while the scene was still secure but days after the initial crime? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, we would ask that those six photographs be introduced as a collective exhibit entitled um, Cotsman Photos. All right. It's number 71. I may publish it to the jury. showing you what I'm going to, for purposes of the record, mark with an A on the back. And then back up. If you could tell us what portion of the um, home at C2 is this? This is the main entrance to the home. And focusing here on this section of the door, can you describe what this black item are that's all over the front screen door? Sure. Uh, this picture was taken on August the 17th, um, a week after the incident occurred. So this, um, this, this black stuff that you see on the door here, um, that's, that's remnants of fingerprint dust from when we had the scene processed earlier in the, during the investigation. And is that typically how a scene may appear once it's been processed by the crime scene investigation? Yes, ma'am. And that would indicate areas that have been dusted for potential fingerprint proof? Yes, ma'am. Now, if we can back up, and I'm for purposes of the record, this would be photo B. You could describe what this is, photograph is showing. Which bathroom is this? This is the bathroom that adjoins uh, Joanna and Jocelyn's bedroom. Um, and again, what, what is, can you describe or point out the areas that have the black fingerprint dust? Sure. Uh, you, you can see uh, fingerprint dust. You, you know, we even uh, had the, the t rim of the toilet processed. Um, fingerprint dust all along the toilet, the lid. Is that the case the uh, perpetrator might have um, cleaned up or Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can see the same thing along the bath along the bathtub. Um, here you see the trash can I was mentioning earlier that I dug that I dug through for evidence. Does that include even that little storage area or medicine um, type cabinet above? Yes, ma'am. Showing you photograph on Mark C. If you could describe which room this is. This is the one we refer to as the master bathroom. And first of all, zooming in, is 
there a parent black vest on the countertop? Yes, ma'am. That you can see some right here. And then around the window area. Yes, ma'am. You can see the same thing on both sides of the of the window frame here. Now, clearly, um, we've already heard from investigator, a crime scene investigator, Lynette Mace, the fact that um, the mattress was collected mm -hmm. and things would have had to have been moved in order to, to get that physically out of the room, correct? Sure. And had that been done um, on the day of the 17th, had that already been done when you were there taking your pictures? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. But in the um, pile of clothing and the objects that were on the side of the bed, on the floor where Johanna was found, did you collect and take pictures of a shoe that you found in that pile of clothing and objects? Yes, ma'am. Show you what marks on this D. Would that be the front of that sandal? Yes, ma'am. And E, what is that showing? That's the same shoe, just the, the bottom side of it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And would this fact be a page of that where she has her phone number listed on that? It is, yes, ma'am. When you were in that master bathroom, what, if any, observations did you make about the curtain on that window we've seen the pictures of that had the um, black dust? Yeah, it was, it was caught in the window, and it was, um, it was torn about halfway. Did you have an opportunity to go to the other side of that window and examine it? Yes. From the outside? Sure. And what, if anything, was visible to you? Uh, there were some uh, tool marks on the outside of that window frame. Did you see any type of rusting or debris in those um, tool marks that would have been indicative of them having been there for some lengthy period of time in the weather? No, ma'am. What, if anything, did you ask other investigative units to do um, on that evening of August the 10th as it related to the neighbors? Sure. Um. Because we had so many other units out there, I kind of coordinated with my chain of command to have them help with it, help help us with this investigation. Um, one of the things I asked them to do was canvas the neighborhood, uh, which is a standard procedure we use on every major case like that. And it, it just means that we go door to door, knocking, uh, trying to look for anybody that might have seen something, heard something, know something, or have video or anything like that. And in addition to uh, working in conjunction with the youth services divisions, uh, did you um, make requests of sex crimes detectives to assist you in this case? Yes, ma'am. I, I asked them to look for any reports of sexually motivated uh, crimes in the area that had been rec recently filed, and also to check up on any uh, sex offenders that, were, um, that lived close to the area. Now, you did not actually take part in the interviews with the families, correct? No. But you had an opportunity to review the recordings of those, correct? I've seen most, most of them at one point or another. Did you, um, were you present when the family and um, friends consented to have their DNA samples taken by use of a buckle swab? Yes, ma'am, I was. And... 
on the next day at about one o'clock, could you describe what type of meeting was held? Um, basically, we got people from just about every specialized unit we could think of, uh, as well as some other eight uh, law enforcement agencies to meet us at Madison Precinct. Um, and at that meeting, um, we just went over the areas of expertise that each unit had and what they could offer to this investigation to try to help us out. Is that standard practice, or have you done that on all of your homicides in the past? No, ma'am. I've never done that before. Now, did you um, have an opportunity on August the 12th uh, to actually show Ms. Velasquez a, a photograph of the master bathroom to help you determine what items might have been changed or removed? Yes, ma'am, I did. And did you um, contact the crime scene investigation unit to have them come collect a, um, a buckle swab sample from the son, the young son of the Ortegas? Yes, ma'am. Oscar Ortega. Mm -hmm. And that was collected and submitted, correct? Yes, ma'am, it was. Did you actually at one point return to the crime scene and collect certain personal items for the family since they were not able to be living in the residence? I did. Mm -hmm. And um, what precautions did you take prior to releasing anything to the family? Uh, before I released anything to the family, I took photographs. Um, I, I limited what we could allow them to take simply because um, we were keeping the crime scene, but they were obviously undergoing some, some pretty serious hardships. Um, so I photographed each thing that they requested uh, and then noted where it was and then... Um, turned it over to them outside of the crime scene. So there would be a documentation of what had been released from the scene? Yes, ma'am. And um, I'm not asking you anything because it would be hearsay as to what the individual said, but did you have an opportunity um, to speak with one of the neighbors, specifically an individual by the name of Russell Wall, spelled W-A-H-L? Yes, ma'am, I did. And did you request that individual to provide you with a voluntary buckle swab for DNA testing? Yes, ma'am, I did. And did that individual consent and provide you with that sample? Yes, ma'am. And was it collected and submitted? It was. Now, on August the 11th of 2017, can you describe what was done with the victim's iPad? I'm sorry, on August, on the, August, the, August the 12th, 12th yes. of 2017, yes. um, we, we turned it over to Detective Chad Gish. Uh, he's with our SISU unit, which is kind of like our computer forensics people. Okay. And um, on 8 13 of 2017, did you return with Detective Hill to once again walk through the crime scene to identify additional items? I'm sorry, on what date? On 8 13. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. And as a result, did you contact crime scene investigator Lynn Mace and have her return um, to collect certain items? Yes, ma'am, I did. Now, on that same day of August 13th of 2017, um, did you have an occasion to search along a certain tree line area? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe where that tree line was and why you searched in that particular area? Sure. Uh, the tree line is basically just the border of, of, of the trailer park there. Um, and it sits just a few feet beyond the end of um, that row of that row of homes, which includes uh, Yolanda's home. Um, so the tree line actually just passes within a few feet of, of, of that back window um, where I had seen the tool marks. And what were you looking for? Anything. Um, sometimes we don't know what we're looking for. We're just looking. Were you able to find any pieces of evidence along no, that track? Um, again, not asking you anything about what was said, but did you have an opportunity to speak to the two residents in trailer uh, B10? Yes, ma'am. Um, were you able to, along with talking to these individuals, were you checking as well to see whether or not anyone had any surveillance cameras or videos in their home? Yes, ma'am, I was. While you were walking the tree line, um, were you able to notice um, a particular vehicle? I did. And what vehicle was that? It was a silver Chevrolet Cavalier. Uh, it was parked in front of uh, 
trailer C4 with a license plate of 7B09X5 or 7B. And again, um, without saying anything anyone said, did you have an opportunity um, to speak to an individual who, who actually didn't live in the trailer park but at a house at 1206 Old Dickerson Pike? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and who was that individual? Um, at 12.06 was, um, let's see, no, I'm sorry, I was looking at 12.16, 12.06, yes. Uh, Tommy Stockton was his name. And um, were you, when you were checking with him, were you also checking to determine whether or not any surveillance cameras were there? Yes, ma'am. And were you able to locate any surveillance cameras there? No. Was that um, a constant question that you asked when, it, when you were canvassing all these different individuals trying to determine if there was, in fact, surveillance video? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Do you remember um, there being actually one location where there was a surveillance video? I do. Mm -hmm. Could you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where that was? Uh, that was at trailer uh, A9 in the same trailer park. So that would be on, I believe we have a photograph that shows the two entrances mm -hmm. in, that would be on the side of the um, opposite entrance. That's correct. Uh -huh. okay. And on that A line of trailers, um, were you able to view around the times of interest um, to see whether or not there was anything unusual at I that did. point? And what did you notice? Uh, there was nothing but a, a couple of ladies that were kind of going door to door uh, with ex red, red shirts with the Comcast Xfinity logo on it. Salesmen or solicitors, essentially? I, I would assume so. Okay. Now, on um, also on 813, again, um, not saying what the person said, but did you have an opportunity to speak with um, the resident at A9, Mona Rogers? I did. Mm -hmm. And was that the one that we were just talking about that had the video? Mm -hmm. Yes. And... On 8-14 of 2017, did you and Detective Hill actually attend Johanna's funeral? Yes, ma'am. And what is the purpose of doing that? Um, really, at the time, we just wanted to see if there was anybody that looked suspicious. And um, we were kind of walking around looking at everybody's shoes, looking, looking for that tread pattern again. Did you, in fact, collect um, the guest book? So you would have um, a record of all the persons who attended in case that might at some later point become of evidence. Yes, ma'am. And many of these things that we're discussing did not turn out to be fruitful, correct? No. Yeah. But at the time you're doing these investigative um, techniques and collections, you don't know what's relevant or what's not. Sure, yeah. We, ne we never know what's going to be important until it becomes important. Did you also, um, on August 14th of 2017, um, have a reason to go to the tobacco store that was located at 6207 Charlotte Pike? Yes, ma'am. And what was your purpose of going there? Uh, our purpose in going there was to verify uh, Marlon Ortega's whereabouts uh, during all this time. Uh, that's Yolanda's father. And... Um, were you able to view any type of surveillance video? Yes, we did. We and did. Um, did what, if anything, were you able to visualize, see, and what was the timing of it as it related to Marlon Ortega? Uh, we could see Marlon arriving at the store at around uh, 6.24 p.m. and leaving at around 6.42 p.m. Uh, right around that time would have been when he got notified of, of Joanna's death. And um, were there technical issues that prevented you from being able to actually physically download that video? There, there were, yes ma'am. But as a result, what did you do? Uh, since we weren't able to obtain a copy of the actual video, I took uh, pictures that showed Marlon in the store uh, along with a timestamp so that we could uh, at least document his timeline. And the... Um, were, when you did that, did you do a time check comparing what time the, the system was saying when you were there compared to your watch to determine whether or not the system was set at the right time? 
Yes. Did yes. you make notation of any discrepancy? I did. Uh, the store surveillance video was slow by about six minutes. Now, the time frame that we're talking about that there is this video, that is after um, Johanna has been discovered, correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, is there actually, a, a, is he visible being on the phone speaking with someone at that time? Yes, he is. The, um, did you also have an opportunity to um, respond to a Honduran bakery um, that was in that generalized area? Yes, we did. And did you talk to persons that were there? Um, Not saying what they said, but did you talk to... I didn't really talk to anyone there. Uh, okay. Detective Hill really handled most of okay. that. And um, did you also um, have an opportunity to go to an apartment complex located at Premier Drive? Yes, ma'am, we did. What part of Nashville is that? Uh, it's in West Nashville, I guess you'd say. And what was your purpose for going to that location? This is the apartment complex where um, Joanna's father lives. Um, we went there to see if there were any surveillance cameras, uh, that, which there were. Um, the office was closed that day, so we, we couldn't download a copy of them that day. But um, with the assistance of another detective picking it up, were you guys ultimately able to obtain and view a surveillance video that showed various vehicles coming in and out of that apartment complex? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And were any of those consistent with the ones being driven by Marlon Ortega? Yes, they were. Now, you don't have anything that's directly within that time period um, when, when Johanna last spoke to her mother or communicated with her mother in the time she was found, you were able to be in a store at a time to actually find a video of him at that particular time frame, correct? Uh, it's been a while since I've reviewed those videos, but I, I don't think we did, no. Okay. But um, all the places that you went to um, in the timeline, was that consistent with information provided to you by Marlon Ortega? Yes, it was. On 8 16 of 2017, did you return to the um, crime scene at C2 to conduct another walkthrough? Yes, ma'am. And what was the purpose of doing that? Uh, we knew we were going to have to release the crime scene the next day. Um, so we just kind of uh, walked through to prioritize, or I guess you'd strat say strategize, uh, a final search of the residence. Um, and then on the following day on 8 17, 17, 2017, did you again conduct a final search of the trailer? Yes, ma'am. Prior to releasing it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was, some, that was some of the photographs that we saw just a few moments ago that you yes. took? Mm -hmm. And those weren't the only photographs you took, were they? No, no, I, I took a number of others. Let's see. In fact, did you take one that actually even showed the back exterior, dust on the back exterior window as well? Uh-huh. Let's see, did um, on eight seventeen of twenty seventeen, um, did you and Detective Hill and Le Lieutenant McCall attend a candlelight vigil for Johanna that was held at the trailer park? We did. And what was the purpose for that? Um, well, for one thing, we wanted to pay our pay our respects, um, but we also just wanted to see if again we at this point we're still looking for someone. We don't know who. Um, so at this point, we are we wanted to see if there might be anybody there that was acting unusually suspicious or, or possibly remorseful or anything like that. The following day on August 18th of 2017, um, did you go along with Detective Hill to um, Lot C4 to interview Roy Coons Jr.? Yes, ma'am. And was that um, interview recorded? It was. Do you see Roy Coons Jr., the person um, on that recording here in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Could you identify him for the court? Uh, he's sitting at the table to my right, uh, sitting next to Mr. Hopkins. On 821 to 2017, did um, you have an opportunity, again, not without saying what the person said, but to interview and speak with a friend of Johanna's named Kennedy. 
Yes, ma'am. And you recorded that interview, correct? Yes. Did you have an opportunity on 822 of 2017 to interview uh, the two ladies that resided at Trailer C1? Yes. And again, without stating what was said, did you record those interviews with those two individuals? Yes, ma'am. And did you have an opportunity to interview a male that um, that lived at times with them by the name of Bill Mowry? I've, I've never spoken to Bill. Okay. You were not present for any of that? Correct. Let's see. On August 24th of 2017, um, did you again, without saying what was said, have an opportunity to speak with um, a, another friend of Johanna's by the name of Darley Valdez. I did. Did you also, that same day, have an opportunity to speak with a friend of, of Johanna's by the name of Nadlin Estrada? Yes, ma'am. On August 30th of 2017, did you have an occasion to return back to the home at Lot C4? Yes, ma'am. Uh, C2. I'm sorry, C2. Mm -hmm. And would you please explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why you did that? Uh, we went, when we went back, Ms. Um, um, Velasquez, uh, um, I'm sorry. You're talking about on August 30th, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, uh, we went back because uh, Joanna's mother um, had found a cigarette on the floor of her bathroom. Um, and Would this have been in that master bathroom? Yes, it was the same master bathroom where the curtain had been torn and the shelf knocked down and all that, all that stuff. Um, so we went there to collect that cigarette along with some eyeglasses and a, and a green jacket. Yeah. And um, did you find out where, from where in that bathroom that cigarette was? It was. Did you see it? Did you have Did you have photographs that were taken of it lying in the floor? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you describe where it was lying in the floor? Uh, it was um, just lying right in the middle of the bathroom floor, really. Um, was it very obvious? Yes. And um, you'd been in that home numerous times. Yes. And had you had photographs taken of that bathroom numerous times? Yes, ma'am. And um, in your memory of being in that bathroom, had you ever seen that cigarette there in the, lying in the middle of the floor? No, ma'am. And in any of the photographs that were taken while the crime scene was secured, is that um, cigarette visible in any of those photographs? No, ma'am. And at the time that you came on August the 30th of 2017, how long had it been since the crime scene tape had been removed and the police officer removed so that the scene was no longer secure? Uh, 13 days. Did you, um, regardless of that, did you still um, have that cigarette collected? Yes, ma'am. And did you still have that cigarette tested? Sure. <clears throat> did you and Detective Hill um, actually bring in particular specialists from the TBI um, in an attempt to see if they could match any shoes or find shoe print um, evidence yes, in this case? Mm -hmm. And were you able to um, have find any conclusive evidence? We, no, we, we've never found any answer to that question. Now, did um, you have an opportunity to, again, speak with an individual by the name of Moses Jonathan Del Carpio? Yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, did you have an opportunity at some point to have a known buckle swab submitted by consent by Moses Jonathan Del Carpio? Yes, ma'am, I did. And is that one of the individuals that was submitted um, to be compared to the evidence in this case? I believe so, yes. 
On September 13th of 2017, did you have an occasion to go with Detective Hill to the Cornerstone Hispanic Church? Yes, I did. And why did you go to that location? Uh, we went there to interview members of the church. Um, and whose church was that? It was the church that the Ortega family attended. Did you um, speak with numerous people at the church? Yes, ma'am, we did. Did you speak with Maria Salvador? Yes. Did you speak with Stephanie Palacio? Yes. Did you speak with Elvis Duarte? Yes, ma'am. Did you speak with Osiris Roja? Yes, ma'am. Did you speak with Juan Antret? Yes. Did you speak with Guinevere Duarte? Yes. Did you speak with Feliciano Meja? Yes, ma'am. And did you also speak with, and I know I'm not saying it right, Ixel, I-X-E-L, Pirer, P-I-R-I-R? Yes, ma'am. Did you have an opportunity on the 14th of September to um, interview an individual by the name of Darby Rodriguez? Yes, ma'am. On September 19th of 1997, did you receive a notification from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Laboratory? Yes, ma'am. And was that relating to um, the result? Yeah, hearsay, it's to explain uh, what he did next, Your Honor. The jury's already heard the evidence of, right. from the direct witness. Did you receive um, information concerning the results of, TB, of YSTR testing? Yes, ma'am. And as a result of that, on that same day, did you have an occasion to go to the Two Rivers Middle School? Yes, ma'am. And what was your purpose of going to the Two Rivers Middle School? Uh, we wanted to interview um, the defendant's father, uh, Roy Coon Sr. And would that be because he's part of the paternal line, consistent, be, mm -hmm. would appear to be part of the paternal line of um, Roy Coons Jr.? Yes, ma'am. And did you, um, not saying what was said, but did you seek to determine his whereabouts at the time of the crime? I did, yes. Um, were you able to actually obtain certain time card information concerning um, whether or not Roy Coon Sr. was employed um, at that job site during the time? Yes, ma'am. And did you record your interview of both uh, Mr. Roy Coons Sr., as well as um, stepmother, Rebecca Coons. Yes, ma'am. Um, on, on September 25th of 2017, um, was an indictment returned against the defendant, Roy Coons Jr.? Yes, ma'am. And did you assist other um, units to um, be involved in surveillance and um, executing that, or executing that, um, service of that indictment upon Mr. Coons? Yes, ma'am. You've been handed um, a plastic bag with an object in it. Do you recognize what that object is? Yes, ma'am. And what is that? Uh, this is... It's, it's, this appears to be a wallet that uh, we submitted, or I submitted, on September 25th of 2017. If you could open the bag for just a moment and... Look inside that wallet and determine whether or not there's a driver's license inside. Here we go. There is. Okay, if you could pull that out. Whose driver's license is that? Uh, belongs to Roy Donald Coons Jr. 
And um, you had an opportunity um, during the time of this investigation to see um, Roy Coons Jr. on numerous occasions, correct? Yes, ma'am. Is his appearance um, more? Is, is his appearance from that time more consistent with how he appears here today in court, or how he appears on that um, driver's license photo? No, it's it's closer to, yeah, it's closer to how he appears in this driver's license. Your Honor, at this time we would introduce that driver's license as the next exhibit and ask to have the remainder of the wallet and contents returned and seek to publish the driver's license. Mr. Coons Jr., were you also present um, when he consented for, to um, allow a buckle swab to be used to obtain a known DNA sample from him? Yes, ma'am. Can you get this back? Do you recognize what's contained in that bag? Yes, ma'am, I do. And what is that? It contains uh, DNA swabs uh, for Roy Coons as well as control swabs. And is there a, you may or may not be able to see it, but is there a TBI um, crime laboratory submission number on that, um, on one of the white labels? I see, a, I see an MNPD number. That, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. I, I'm not familiar with their okay. procedure, so I'm not <laughs> sure right, what I'm At this time, for. we would ask that the um, buckle swabs obtained from Way Coons Jr. be introduced as the state's next exhibit. And if I could have the exhibit a moment. Thank you, Your Honor. Showing you this label code reading MNPD Crime Laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, what does this submission number appear to be? Uh, number 71. Being handed another bag if you're familiar with that bag and what it contains. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what it contains? Sure. Um, this is the um, a brown bag that contains uh, the cigarette butt that we had previously spoken about that was on the middle of the bathroom floor on August the 30th. Uh, this package also contains a pair of eyeglasses that I collected that day. Your Honor, we'd ask that that package be introduced as the state's next Exhibit. Been handed another bag, if you could identify it. Yes, ma'am. This is a set of buckle swabs from Oscar Ortega, and Joanna's little brother. We'd ask that that be introduced as the state's next exhibit. Ask if you recognize what's contained in that bag. Yes, ma'am. What is that? Uh, this is, contains um, DNA swabs for um, Moses Jonathan Del Carpio, as well as control swabs for that sample as well. And who is Moses Del Carpio? Uh, I believe he is. He's he, he's the son of the pastor at the church. You know, this time we ask that that be introduced as the next exhibit. Been handed another bag. If you could please 
State if you recognize it and describe the contents. Yes, ma'am. This is a set of DNA swabs for Russell Wall, who lives at the same trailer park. It, this bag also contains a set of control swabs for him as well. We'd ask that that be introduced as the next exhibit. Class, can you describe what's in that clear plastic bag? Yes, ma'am. This is a fingerprint card um, for Moses Jonathan Del Carpio. Um, and, and how was that obtained? It, it was obtained with his with his consent uh, by me. Um, we didn't have his fingerprints on file, so um, I asked him to provide his fingerprints to us for comparison with um, evidence in this case, and he agreed to do that. And did you mark down on there um, his... Demographic, I mean, not his demographics, but his height and weight and things of that ish. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What was that? He was five foot, seven inches, and 200 pounds. We'd ask that be introduced as the state's next exhibit. Yes, sir. Sure. The uh, cigarette butt that you obtained a week or two after the crime scene had been released had never been seen before. There was no evidentiary value to that, correct? Right? Uh, there turned out not to be. Had. As well as the glasses that were found. Correct. They weren't linked to Mr. Coons or anyone else, to your knowledge. That's correct. And the difference in Mr. Coons' appearance is that his hair was a lot shorter then than it is now. Is that right? Well, he, he was also, also much skinnier. I didn't see a weight listed on that driver's license. You know how much you weighed in 2017? I know what was in our records in 2017. I don't know how much he actually weighed. So you said that the crime scene was secured, but initially it was not. I, when I say it was not, uh, this the mother called 911, for example, and paramedics were arriving at the scene and not been from, from the time that the crime occurred until our officers secured the scene, it was not secure. How long a period of time was that? Um, let's see. I, I don't have the exact time that the first arriving officer responded, but I guess it would be sometime between 16 and 15 hours and when that first officer responded. And are you aware of a pair of rubber gloves being found that have been discarded by an officer? Yes, sir. So there had been some contamination and things left that had nothing to do with the offense. Well, those were left outside of the crime scene. Right. Um, now, regarding the outside window, you noticed some tool marks, but you're not testifying that you're a tool mark expert, correct? That's correct. So you don't know how long those tool marks have actually been on the outside of that window? No, sir. Are you aware of the DNA that was found on the outside of that window? Yes, sir. Or on the outside? Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of that. It appears, based on your testimony, that you did a lot of things in this case that was either the first time you had done it or it was unusual in regards to your investigation. Is that fair to say? Some things, yes. And is that because you were receiving some intense pressure to get this case solved from your superiors? No, I received no pressure at all. You never received calls from anyone higher than you saying, what's the status of this case? Can we get this moving? We need to get somebody charged. Nothing. The only, the only thing they ever asked me about was if they could offer us any more resources or help or anything like that. But it appeared that some thing, unusual measures were taken here that just had never happened in any of your other homicide investigations? Yes, sir. Why is that? Well, it's the first time I've ever investigated a 12-year-old's murder. There's other children that are murdered in Nashville every day. Why was this one treated differently? Yeah, I, it's the first one I've ever investigated. I can't speak to how other people investigate a, a crime like that. To your knowledge, were any fingerprints recovered from the scene that matched Mr. Coons? No, sir. To your knowledge, was any DNA of Mr. Coons found on the ligature that was the murder weapon? Um, I think there was DNA on there, but I don't think there was any conclusive. I don't think we know who it belonged to. 
Were you involved in the search of Mr. Coon's automobile? Um, I, I may have observed it. I don't. I, I, I certainly didn't search it myself. Well, to your knowledge, there was nothing found in the automobile of evidence you're driving, correct? That's correct. And his car was eventually returned back to the family? Yes, sir. And you found no matches of any shoe prints belonging to either Mr. Coons or, for that matter, anyone else in this case? That's correct. Of evidence you're driving? Yes, sir. And the only surveillance camera footage you found was from the other side of the trailer park? We had stuff from the stores and things like that that I mentioned earlier. Talking about on the scene, around the scene. Right, right, yes. That was uh -huh. the only one. Well, that's the only one I remember, yes, sir. And that showed nothing of evidentiary value. Correct. Now, regarding the other surveillance videos we've heard about, you did that in an attempt to narrow down where certain people were during this expected time for death. Yes, sir. And you found none during the time that you believe that she made them. Found none what? No video. No video. Uh, Let me ask it another way. You you were looking for a period of time to determine where certain people had been. And you did that, one of the ways you did that was by looking at surveillance video footage at a number of places that you testified to. Sure. So, for example, with the father, Mr. Ortega, you were looking for periods of time, but this approximately 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, you have no video footage showing where he was. Uh, no, I don't think we do. And for that matter, you have no video footage to show where anyone was that was relevant to this case. Right, right, yeah. Um, do you know why Mr. Ortega's cell phone information wasn't gathered and analyzed? No. When you went to interview Mr. Coons, um, that was approximately a week after this uh, crime had occurred. Yes, sir. It was eight, eight days after. Eight days after. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, this this uh, crime had received a lot of media attention. Some, yes. Mm -hmm. And the details of the killing and things like that were already kind of out in the community. Um, no, we, we actually intentionally withhold a lot of details um, from the press so that we can verify um, information that we get later, any potential confessions or anything like that later on. So... Her exact, uh, a lot of the details from the crime scene were withheld. Do you know what all the family was telling neighbors and people that night when it first happened? No, sir. Um, she's on 911, the mother, uh, is she not saying that her daughter's been strangled? Uh, probably. I, I haven't heard that, that 911 tape in, in a couple of years. So. so as far as the neighbors that were milling around when this first happened before the scene was secured, you don't know what they were telling neighbors? No. And there were at least 10, maybe 20 officers around the neighborhood the night of this crime occurred. Would that be a fair uh, number? Or did you have a response? I, I, yeah, I, I went to the scene. That, there was a lot of officers there. I, I, I don't know how many. I, and you don't know what each of those officers were telling residents of the community? Correct. But when you went to interview Mr. Coon some eight days later... He was cooperative with you. Yes, sir. He answered your questions. Yes, sir. And he voluntarily gave you a DNA sample. Yes, sir. Now, sometimes people won't give you DNA samples voluntarily. Is that correct? Sometimes. And in that situation, you have to go, if you can, and, and get a search warrant. If, if, if we still want their DNA after that, yes. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have to do that in relation to Mr. Jones. Correct. And... We'll probably hear that statement later, but we've heard statements from him already. He never told you that he wasn't didn't live in that neighborhood. Right. He said that he lived there. Mm -hmm. He said that he knew the Artegas. Yes. And he said that he had been in that trailer before they moved in doing work. Yes. You knew all of that before you went to interview him, though, didn't you? No. No. But you received that information through him that he voluntarily gave you. Right. Uh-huh. And when you arrested him in late September, you arrested him at Lot C4. Yes. The address is on his driver's license. I don't have his license in front of me, but that's the, the, the that's where we know him to live or to have been living. Okay. And he had been interviewed how many times at this point before you arrested him? Just once by me. What about the night of? 
Uh, I think the, he, during the canvas, I think there was a detective that spoke with him. And I think one of the first responding officers spoke with him. Okay. And so he was interviewed the night of, that you're aware of, correct? Right. Uh -huh. And that would be August the 10th, 2017. Yes, sir. He's interviewed by you eight days later. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you have taken DNA from him that he can send it to, so he knows that you're running his DNA. Objection, Your Honor. Just to the form of the question, asking him what Mr. Coons knows. Right. You don't take people's DNA from the phone. No, it's... It's for, it's for evidence collection. Yes. Um, did Mr. Coons appear to be confused about why you wanted his DNA? No. All right. So he's been interviewed several times. His DNA's been taken. And... Approximately, the crime occurred on the 10th of August. He was arrested the 24th of September. So about six weeks later, he's still at that location? I think it was the 25th. 25th. Right. Okay. Of September 2017. Yes, sir. So after he's been interviewed, he has uh, knowingly given up his DNA. Six weeks later, he's still at Los Eagle. Well, no, he, he'd actually left for some time. Okay, but you knew where he was. Yeah, we, we we found him. He never left Nashville. I, I we didn't have like twenty four hour surveillance or anything on him, so I can't say where he was at all times. But but you know, at the time of his arrest, when you went looking for him at the address on his driver's license, that's where you found him. Right, correct. All right. And you have no evidence that he ever left Nashville from August tenth until you arrested him September twenty fifth, twenty seventeen. Correct. Someone by the name of Drexel? Yes, sir. And that was unsuccessful? Yes, sir. And there was no follow-up done? Um, we later learned that Drexel was... Um, Did you ever interview Mr. Drexel? No, no. Let me see if I have it in my notes. I, I don't have it in my notes, and I, I don't recall. When detectives like yourself interview witnesses and even potential suspects, because at this point everybody is a suspect, right? Sure. When you're doing that, you're using your observation techniques that you have. Mm -hmm. You're not just listening, you're looking. Sure. And... So you're looking at Mr. Coons like you did all the other witnesses who you interviewed up to that point, correct? Sure, yeah. And you noticed, noticed nothing unusual about his appearance, or you would have put it in your report? Yeah, that's correct. you testified to about about this partial YSTR potential match to Mr. Coons. Objection to the form of the question, Your Honor. Incorrectly states the facts and testimony that's been presented. Okay. When you received this information regarding DNA evidence, um, you immediately charged Mr. Coons. Like no, sir. It was, it was six days later. Six days later? Yes, sir. And you arrested him on September 25th? Yes, sir. And you have essentially done no further investigation into this case since that time? Um, it's not exactly true, no. Okay. Do you have any other reports indicating that you continued investigating other suspects after that point? Um, no, no, I'm sorry. Um, I did some work to verify um, Roy's father's uh, whereabouts after after Roy was arrested. Were you aware after the 
after September 25th that other partial male DNA profiles not consistent with Mr. Coons was found in that residence. Can you, can you say that again? Sure. Were you notified that other strands of DNA that were male strands of DNA were found in lot C2 in the crime scene after September 25th. Did you know that? After September 25th. Not that it was found after September 25th. Right. After his arrest, did you, were you made aware that other male foreign DNA profiles had been found in that location? I, I know there I do remember there was some partial profiles that were, um, that we weren't able to, you know, necessarily place on a person, if that's what you mean. Were you aware that according to experts that there could have been as many as two to three or four other male DNA profiles, unidentified partial profiles in that residence? I, I don't remember the number. I would, I would have to see the DNA report um, to refresh my memory. But well, Did you even look at the DNA reports after September 25th? Uh, I, I probably did. Once, once Roy had been arrested, um, I would, because I, I have a supervisory role with my unit, um, which I kind of set aside for six weeks to focus on this case. So once Roy had been arrested, um, I kind of delved back into helping you know, my other four or five detectives uh, with more stuff. And so my time was devoted less to this case after, after Roy was arrested. And you're, I'm not to indicate that you're, you're not a DNA expert. No, sir. But... You knew there were no fingerprints of Mr. Coons in the residence. Well, there, there were no fingerprints that we matched to Mr. Coons. Right. And you knew that there had been no semen or bodily fluids of Mr. Coons found in the residence. Correct. And you knew there were no eyewitnesses placing Mr. Coons at the residence. That's true. And you knew that Mr. Coons had been in that trailer a lot uh, over the years before his DNA. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how much it was. He said he had, he'd been in there when the previous owner had lived there a couple of years earlier. And then you charged him? Yes. And in your mind, that was, that was it and you didn't do anything else? No, we still, we still did more stuff. Related to Mr. Coons, but not to any of his other suspects? Um, well, we... Really not necessarily just Mr. Coons, but his, his paternal lineage as well. Okay. But again, centered around Mr. Coons and his line, but nothing about any of this other male foreign DNA or other suspects. No, that's, yeah. Because you had other suspects, did you not? No, we, we never had um, anyone that I felt comfortable calling a suspect until the day um, that we got a DNA match on Roy. Okay. Well, did, did you not investigate... Reports of unidentified Hispanic males. Objection, Your Honor. Well, I think you can ask that particular question. We're just objecting to asking questions containing hearsay. Well, he's testified that there were no other suspects on the building. As I said, you can ask that particular question. But did you not investigate reports that there had been other Hispanic males at that location the day she was killed? Sure. So there were other suspects? No. You didn't deem those to be suspects? No. Despite the fact someone gave you a sketch. Objection, Your Honor. Can we be yeah. heard? I'll throw the question. Question. That's all. You have any redirect? Very briefly. You um, mentioned the fact that you spoke with Roy Coons Jr. on, I believe, the 18th, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that he was arrested on the 25th of September, is that correct? I, th I think so, yeah. During that time frame, were you able to locate another location where Mr. Coons had gone to live after your interview on the 18th. Yes, ma'am. And where was that location? 
he was living in a in a tent underneath a billboard, um, basically by some some train tracks near the stadium in. You were asked about pressure, whether or not you essentially were, I think the question was alluding to, were you pressured into making an arrest in this case? Were you pressured into no, making no, an not, arrest? No, not at all. Never heard one word about it. Would you, if some, if someone had tried to pressure you into just making an arrest to get this off the books, what effect would that have had on you, given what you saw in Trailer C2? That, it had, that would have no, no effect on me. That's, um, to be honest with you, that's not a believable scenario um, in, in my head. I, hundreds of investigations that I've, I've never had anybody try to pressure me to close one. What motivated you in your investigation in this case? Objection to relevance. Your Honor, he's the one who attacked his motivation well, on this investigation. Well, I think he's actually answered the question previously, 12 years ago. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Okay, any further? No, no, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Judge. Uh, one out of All rise. State would like to make a motion, a request of the court to um, instruct defense counsel not to ask questions putting forth blatant hearsay um, in the presence of the jury. We would request a jury out hearing before any such questions are done, since the state clearly cannot unring a bell once it has been rung. <laughs> this is now twice we've had this issue occur. Well, obviously, you heard your request. Uh, if some question of, of that nature comes up, you make an objection and I'll sustain it. Your Honor, we would just ask, since Mr. Hopkins knows that the basis of his question involves hearsay, that we address it outside the court. We do not know what question he is asking until we have heard the question. And if we have heard the question, then that means that the jury has made the question heard the question, so we cannot anticipate what he is saying for the question. So we would just ask if Mr. Hopkins is aware that his question involves hearsay, that just as the state has done in this case and has had hearings to get a ruling of admissibility, that the state be granted the same fair trial that we are trying to give Mr. Coons. Your Honor, my question is based on him saying there were no other suspects. That can be done, Your Honor, then in that hearing. I'll allow the question, did I not? I'm not complaining, sir. Okay. 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 But you, you see the state's point. I, I and understand. We, and I think each side understands. So we'll deal with it if it comes up. All right? Thank you, Your Honor.